everyone. I'm Rob Stavins. I'm a professor at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, a director of the Harvard Project on Climate Agreements. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this session, realizing the potential of the Paris Agreement. Uh, the session is co-sponsored by Arizona State University, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, uh, Tufts University, and the Harvard Project on Climate Agreements. Uh, our purpose this morning in this session is to examine how the Paris Agreement can be elaborated, how it can be implemented, and how it can be complemented uh, so that its potential to advance mitigation as well as adaptation is best realized. Uh, among other subtopics, we anticipate looking at the relationship between national policies and multilateral action uh, and approaches to increasing ambition over uh, time. I'm going to start with a few introductory comments and then I'm going to turn and introduce to you with this very distinguished panel that we have who also represent the co-sponsoring institutions. So just very briefly to int introduce this uh, topic. The Paris Climate Agreement uh, presents both uh, good news and also, of course, some challenges. Uh, I'll say my view, but I think it's viewed held across the panel is that it's a landmark climate accord, a dramatic departure in structure and approach from the previous 20 years of climate negotiations. And it does indeed provide a broad foundation for meaningful future progress, largely due to the expanded scope of coverage compared certainly to the Kyoto Protocol, which came before. So this new approach can be a key step towards reducing the threat of climate change. So it can be. The question is, will it be? So whether the agreement itself is ultimately successful is something none, none of us in this room uh, know presently because it's not going to be known for decades. Uh, the Paris Agreement does provide this important opportunity for a new path forward. And you could think of there being two key necessary conditions for ultimate success. One is adequate scope of participation, and we've gone from the 14% of the Kyoto Protocol to 90% of coverage of the participating countries under the Paris Agreement, at least as of today. But another key necessary condition is certainly adequate ambition of the individual uh, policies at the national, regional, or subnational level and successful implementation, that is compliance. And those challenges provide the opportunity and really the need for creative thinking and analysis. And that's what uh, academic institutions, that's what we are trained to do for a living. And that's what we hope to be able to provide by the discussion on this panel uh, and the members of the panel who I will shortly introduce. In terms of the Harvard Project on Climate Agreement itself, as some of you know, its mission is to help identify the key design elements of a scientifically sound, uh, economically sensible, and politically pragmatic international policy architecture for global climate change. Although it's called the Harvard Project, uh, and although I'm an economist, it's much broader than that in both dimensions. We draw on research and ideas from leading thinkers around the world, from academia, not just economics, but political science, law, and international relations. Those are all represented, I'm happy to say, on this panel. Uh, from private industry, from environmental NGOs, and certainly from governments. We have 75 research initiatives. Uh, in Argentina, Australia, China, Europe, India, Japan, and the United States. And we do intensive work uh, at the annual climate negotiations and in many other venues around the world in which I know a number of you in this room I can see uh, have participated in, in the past. So the Harvard Project uh, held a workshop this summer and everyone that's on the stage was part of that workshop. We brought together the 21 leading researchers from around the world. No one we invited said no. Oh, the 21 leading researchers from around the world who can contribute to a discussion of next steps on international climate change policy after the Paris Agreement uh, comes into force. So we held a workshop at Harvard in July, brought together these researchers from uh, China, Germany, India, Italy, Norway, the United Kingdom, and the United States. 
And we produced in the process a report, which you can see a photo of there. It is available on our website. Um, I think we might have a few copies here. Unfortunately, not nearly enough for everyone who's present. But if you don't get a copy and you'd like it, um, you can get it on the website. And what it contains is uh, more than 20 uh, brief reports that are intended really for policymakers. So four to five page documents that lay out one of or more of the following key challenges that are here. Legal dimensions of elaboration and implementation, uh, differentiation among parties, enhancing mitigation ambition, elaborating the transparency uh, mechanism, uh, providing for forestry and land use coverage, climate finance regime, adaptation, uh, market mechanisms, and then finally, and quite importantly, complementary and supplementary institutions, whether those are clubs or mini laterals and more beyond that. So in terms of the uh, next steps, uh, the first one after the workshop was indeed the document that you see, but now a number of the uh, researchers who wrote those brief uh, papers that are in this monograph are actually now carrying out more research, and we're going to hear from some of them uh, today, including myself. So that's, uh, that's where it currently stands. So this panel is essentially... Uh, a next step for us because what we're going to be doing is sharing with you some of the work that's in there and that's ongoing on how to help the Paris Agreement live up to what we think its potential is. So I'm joined, uh, I'm joined on the panel by three really distinguished participants who are well known to not only the research community but the climate change policy community. Uh, Daniel Bodansky, who is a professor of law at uh, Arizona State University. At the Sandra Day O'Connor University of Berlin. And he's also, of course, at the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research, a sponsor of this, and the Commons and Climate Change. And Kelly Gallagher, a professor of energy and environmental policy at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy of Tufts University. And then some of you probably know her and have worked with her in her previous role as part of the negotiating team uh, of the uh, government of the US. So the last thing I'll say before I turn to introduce our first panelist is because of an uh, unfortunate confluence of events. Uh, I'm actually going to uh, leave the stage before the conclusion of this session, probably during our Q&A period, but that need not be a problem at all uh, because of the fact that the co-director of the Harvard Project on Climate Agreements, Dr. Robert Stowe, is right in the middle of the table, con table controlling the computer, and so he will then uh, moderate the Q&A session at whatever point I have to quietly and I hope unobtrusively depart uh, and he'll take over from there. So we're going to begin with Dan Bodansky, who's going to talk about legal aspects of the elaboration of the Paris Agreement. I, I don't think there's anyone in the world who is better to talk about this topic. Uh, and uh, the proof is in the pudding and some of that pudding is forthcoming from Oxford University Press uh, this year, his co-authored book, is being published and the title of that book tells you all you need to know it's titled international climate change law so dan please well thanks very much and on behalf of sandra day o'connor college of law and arizona state university which is co-sponsoring the side event wanted to welcome you and thank you for coming today so I'd originally planned to be speaking exclusively about the uh, legal issues in elaborating the Paris Agreement. Uh, the US uh, presidential election has caused me to revisit that. I've been getting many, many questions this week about uh, the effects of the election and particularly the issue about possible US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. So I was going to uh, speak about that briefly at the end since that seems to be a topic that's very much in everyone's mind. So just to begin with, um, the legal character of the Paris Agreement. This was a huge issue in the negotiation of the Paris Agreement. 
Um, it was one of the, the last issue to be decided in Durban when the negotiations began, and it was the last issue to be decided in Paris, the, the last plenary session on Saturday. Um, and what happened in Paris was essentially a hybrid outcome on legal ish uh, form. Uh, in terms of the legal character of the Paris Agreement itself, it's a treaty within the meaning of international law, uh, clearly uh, satisfies the definition of a treaty under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, but not all of its provisions create legal obligations. Uh, it contains a mix of different kinds of provisions, some of which create obligations and some of which do not. Um, so just to illustrate this in terms of the mitigation provisions of the Paris Agreement, um, there are legally binding elements uh, on mitigation, commitments by all parties to prepare, communicate, uh, and, up and maintain NDCs, to pursue domestic mitigation measures, to provide information, uh, to communicate successive NDCs every five years, uh, and so forth and so on. But then important provisions dealing with mitigation are non-binding. Uh, for example, the provision that was the last to be decided on Saturday evening in Paris, that developing countries should rather than shall take the lead by communicating economy-wide absolute emission reduction targets. Uh, similarly, the provisions dealing with progression and highest possible ambition use the verb will rather than shall, indicating that they create expectations on the part of parties but don't create legal obligations. Uh, same is true with respect to the finance provisions of the Paris Agreement. They contain a mix of binding and non-binding elements, although with respect to finance, I would say more of it is in the non-binding uh, category. Uh, for example, developed countries should take, continue to take the lead in mobilizing climate finance. Uh, other countries are encouraged but not required to provide financial resources. And just to make clear that that's not a binding obligation, they also add the word voluntarily uh, in that provision. Uh, relatively few legal obligations in the Paris Agreement with respect to finance, uh, and these largely simply continue existing obligations. Uh, there's the provision uh, the developing countries shall provide financial resources, but then with the qualification in continuation of their existing obligations. The only really new uh, obligations, legal obligations with respect to finance uh, relate to reporting. Okay, so now uh, where we are today, Paris Agreement has been adopted. It has this hybrid legal character as I've been describing. The question now is uh, elaborating the Paris Agreement, uh, how will the Paris Agreement be taken forward? And so there are many, many provisions of the Paris Agreement uh, that could potentially be elaborated through uh, additional decisions by the CMA or others uh, through guidelines, uh, uh, procedures, modalities, and so forth. And this is not an exhaustive list, but I've listed up here some of the important provisions of the Paris Agreement uh, that uh, could potentially be elaborated, for example, with respect to NDCs, specification of what kind of upfront information countries need to communicate uh, to promote clarity, transparency, and understanding. Uh, what kinds of features might futures um, uh, NDCs contain? Uh, communication of NDCs, uh, how will that take place? It's common time. And there are these uh, provisions uh, that require, or that at least could be elaborated, dealing with NDCs, uh, market mechanisms, adaptation, finance, finance, capacity building, transparency, uh, the global stock take, and implementation and compliance. So essentially all of the uh, different parts of the Paris Agreement uh, could potentially be elaborated. And largely what this COP has been about has been to develop a work plan for this process of elaborating the Paris Agreement. So let me just try to identify a few of what I see as the key variables or issues uh, in elaborating the Paris Agreement uh, going forward. So there's the question of uh, what kind of rule uh, is called for with respect to particular aspects of the Paris Agreement. So. The Paris Agreement refers to decisions that the CMA might take to modalities, procedures, and guidelines, MPGs, as they're now being referred to. So there's the question, what type of rule uh, will be used uh, for specific issues uh, in the Paris Agreement? Uh, there's a second question, to whom the rules apply? And uh, I think here there's an important distinction to be made between rules that would be elaborated that apply to the parties that govern the conduct of parties to the Paris Agreement and rules that would be governing uh, how the Paris institutions work. Um, so for example, rules relating to the development of a new market mechanism would fall in the second category. The development of rules relating to the implementation and compliance mechanism, these are institutional rules relating to how the Paris Agreement institutions work rather than uh, governing the party of conduct of parties. In contrast, rules relating to the accounting of NDCs by parties these are rules governing party conduct. Um, so, I, and I'm going to come back to that distinction because I think it's an important one uh, in a 
couple of uh, slides from now. Uh, then there's a third question, uh, must the CMA act? Uh, is that required or is it optional? And I'll come back to that as well. Uh, fourth issue, what's the default if the CMA fails to adopt a rule? Uh, for any of you who've been to many COPs like I have, uh, the possibility that the CMA may not be able to reach agreement and come up with a rule is a very real one. So what is the default? What happens if the CMA is unable to adopt a rule? Um, is it the case that nothing goes, that you can't go forward? Or is it the case that parties will self-apply the Paris Agreement in the absence of internationally or multilaterally agreed upon rules? So I'll come back to that one as well. And then finally, the question uh, of the bindingness of rules. What will be the legal character of the rules adopted uh, by the CMA? So on the question, uh, must the CMA act? Uh, so this is an issue um, that the Paris Agreement often doesn't provide a lot of clarity on. Um, the Paris Agreement does task the CMA with adopting rules on certain issues. And these are usually indicated by wording in the Paris Agreement that the CMA shall do something. Uh, mm -hmm. the CMA, for example, Article 1313 says the CMA, the first conference of the party is the meeting of the parties, the Paris Agreement, the CMA 1, shall adopt uh, modalities, procedures, and guidelines for the transparency of action and support. So this is something uh, where the CMA is tasked with developing the rules. In other cases, the Paris Agreement basically authorizes the CMA to do something, but it doesn't require action by the CMA. And I think this is usually indicated in the agreement by uh, wording such as the party shall do something in accordance with any rules the CMA adopts. So the reference to any rules suggests the possibility that there might not be rules. Uh, CMA can adopt rules, but they don't have to. So for example, uh, information necessary for clarity, transparency, and understanding, um, uh, that's uh, those rules, I think, uh, optional whether the uh, CMA does adopt rules uh, or not. Uh, similarly, with respect to features of NDCs, again, optional. And then in many cases, the Paris Agreement, I would say, is unclear. It says that the party shall do something in accordance with CMA guidance, but doesn't say necessarily whether there has to be CMA guidance or not. If there is CMA guidance, parties shall act in accordance with it, but there may not be any CMA guidance. Now, moving to the second issue, the default of the CMA fails to adopt a rule. Um, I think uh, there's a key distinction here between uh, rules that are institutionally oriented and rules that govern party conduct. With respect to rules that are institutional, if the rules are not adopted, then I think nothing happens. Uh, nothing, uh, the institution simply fails to come into existence. So for example, the new market mechanism in Article 6.4, if the CMA is unable to adopt rules, modalities, and procedures for this new mechanism, then the mechanism will never get off the ground. Uh, if the CMA never adopts modalities and procedures for the implementation and compliance mechanism, there will not be an implementation and compliance mechanism. We can see that clearly from the framework convention context, where the framework convention called for the establishment of a multilateral consultative process and then tasked the COP with adopting rules for the multilateral consultative process. The COP was never able to adopt rules relating to that multilateral consultative process, and there, as a result, is no multilateral consultative process under the Framework Convention, even though the Framework Convention provides for it. Now, this is a very different situation than rules governing party conduct, where I think if no rules are adopted, essentially the situation will be parties will self-apply whatever norms are in the Paris Agreement, and they will interpret them and apply them as they see fit. So with respect to what kind of upfront information they need to provide when they communicate NDCs, if there are no rules adopted, parties will decide. Uh, features of NDCs, again, parties will be able to decide. Uh, timeframes, common timeframes. If there are no common timeframes, it'll be the situation that happened in Paris where countries each have their own individual, can have different timeframes. And I think one I just wanted to highlight here is uh, internationally transferred mitigation outcomes. Um, these are provided for in Article 6.2. Um, I think contrary to what some people are suggesting, in my view at least, if there are no rules adopted for ITMOs, for internationally transferred mitigation options, it's not the case that ITMOs will not be possible. It'll be simply that parties can do ITMOs, can do internationally tra transferred mitigation outcomes. They have to still satisfy the no double uh, uh, counting rule. They have to account for it in a way that doesn't double count those, but they will be able to develop their own rules. The absence of rules decided by the CMA will not prevent that from taking place. And then finally, on the bindingness of rules, um, uh, uh, I think this depends on three factors that I just wanted to briefly highlight. One is, what does the Paris Agreement say? When the Paris Agreement says parties shall do something in accordance with, 
or consistent with a decision of the CMA, that suggests that there can potentially at least be a legal obligation, that whatever the CMA decides, parties are required under the Paris Agreement to act in accordance with or consistent with that CMA decision. Uh, a second, though, factor here is what kind of rule does the CMA adopt? Uh, the term decision is used in some contexts, and I think a decision clearly uh, suggests something that might be legally binding. Uh, in other cases, though, the Paris Agreement refers to guidance or guidelines, and normally we think of guidance and guidelines as not being legally binding. So when the Paris Agreement says parties shall act in accordance with guidance by the CMA, a question, is that legally binding guidance or not? Uh, in accordance with suggests it is, but the term guidance suggests perhaps not. And then finally, there's the language of the rule. So there's no question that uh, the CMA can adopt binding rules relating to upfront information. But actually, the Paris decision on upfront information used the verb may rather than shall. So even though the COP uh, or the CMA has the authority to adopt legally binding decisions about what upfront information parties have to provide, they chose not to exercise that authority in the Paris decision. So this is just finally just an overview slide that illustrates how these different act, uh, factors interact. So on the left is a series of different kinds of rules the CMA might adopt on upfront information, features, common timeframes, and so forth and so on. And then I've tried to elaborate the type of rule that the uh, Paris Agreement calls for, whether CMA action is required or optional, what is the default if the CMA fails to adopt a rule, and then finally, if the CMA adopts a rule, what will be the binding character? And I'm not going to walk through that again. I've, I've tried to provide some, uh, some illustrations, but this is trying to put together uh, the pre previous three slides into a single uh, kind of uh, format. Now, finally, let me just say a few words about options for U.S. withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. This has obviously been raised by the election of Donald Trump as uh, president-elect of the U.S. Um, there are, I think, three uh, different options here for what the U.S. might do in terms of uh, if President Trump decides he wants to withdraw. One is to withdraw pursuant to the Paris Agreement. Uh, Article 28 provides that parties may withdraw by providing one-year notice starting three years after entry into force. So. Um, under Article 28, uh, President Trump uh, could file a notice of withdrawal uh, beginning November 4th, 2019, which would take effect in November 24th, 2020. Um, that's permitted under the agreement explicitly, no question that would be authorized. Uh, and I think there's relatively little doubt that under U.S. constitutional law, the president has authority to withdraw from executive agreements. Uh, the Paris Agreement never received advice and consent by the Senate, so president entered into it, the president similarly can exit from it. Uh, a second option, if the President Trump doesn't want to wait till 2020 to withdraw, what some people are calling the nuclear option, is to withdraw from the Framework Convention pursuant to Article 25 of the Framework Convention, which allows countries to provide withdraw by giving one year's notice. Essentially, the same provision that's in the Paris Agreement is in the Framework Convention. And the Paris Agreement provides that if you withdraw from the Framework Convention, you also thereby also withdraw from the Paris Agreement. So this would allow President Trump to withdraw from the Framework Convention uh, by giving one year's notice, would take effect, uh, uh, and then would at the same time also withdraw the uh, U.S. from the Paris Agreement. Um, I'd say under U.S. law in practice, there's little doubt that President Trump could do this without challenge, even though the Framework Convention received unanimous advice and consent by the Senate. Um, some people argue that since the Senate approved the treaty, the Senate would also have to approve exiting from the treaty. That question has never been definitively resolved. But I think what's clear is that in practice, it, mounting a legal challenge on that basis would be extremely difficult, uh, if not impossible. And not to say it's impossible, uh, but I think in practice, the likelihood is a decision by President Trump uh, would, uh, would stand. And then finally, there's the option of exiting outside the terms of the Paris Agreement, uh, simply just saying on day one, we're out, uh, we're withdrawing. That would be in violation of the Paris Agreement. It would be in violation of uh, the Framework Convention. It would violate international law. And whether the president could do that under US law, again, I think would be very difficult to challenge. But I think there is some, uh, some uncertainty uh, in US law as to whether the president can withdraw in violation of international law. Now, finally, uh, implications of US withdrawal um, for the UN climate regime, um, US participation was seen as key. So I think uh, there's at least the potential that if the US withdraw, others might also want to withdraw as well. But I think one of the things that I found very heartening this week in uh, Marrakesh has been 
that other countries seemed quite determined to go ahead with or without the U.S. So uh, that was what happened when the U.S. withdrew from the Kyoto Protocol. It redoubled the determination of other countries to go forward. Um, so I think that seems to be the indications I'm getting here in Marrakesh seem to be that really U.S. withdrawal could make others more determined to proceed, which I think would be a very heartening result. For climate mitigation more generally, I think if the U.S. withdrew, it would really put additional emphasis on the importance of action by state and local governments and by the private sector, uh, particularly within the U.S. Uh, obviously, U.S. credibility would be significantly hurt. Uh, but I think here, the manner in which the U.S. withdraws would have an effect. Uh, withdrawing in violation of international law would be even more damaging to U.S. credibility uh, than by, uh, withdrawing pursuant to the terms of the agreement. Withdrawing from the Framework Convention, in my view, would be a much more drastic step than withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. So the manner in which the U.S. withdraw, if it does withdraw, I think would be important. So that concludes my remarks. Thanks very much for your attention. Uh, great. Dan, thank you very much. Uh, two uh, brief announcements. I notice people keep coming in, some standing in the back along the sides. There are seats up front, uh, box seats at, available at the same price. Um, for me to take my own part of this. I'll say yesterday I was over at the uh, China Pavilion speaking, and when I was introduced by a, a gentleman from the Chinese government, uh, he said, Dennis Stevens is going to bring us some good news from the United States, um, which was rather a challenge. And uh, what I said, this is, I'm saying it to follow up on Dan, what I said uh, then was, when you're as old as I am, you recognize that four years is not a long time. So that's an important thing to keep in mind for all the delegations. Uh, so the topic I'm going to focus on is one key element among many. Uh, for implementation of the Paris Agreement, and that's international linkage of policies, uh, specifically under Article 6. Point, I need the clicker. Uh, Article 6.2 of the Paris Agreement. So this is stimulated by, by the following, that there is a key challenge, and that is that the Paris Agreement, since the entire structure with the NDCs is that they're anchored in domestic political realities, that raises the question of whether or not they will adequately address emissions with sufficient ambition. And then that raises the subsidiary question of, are there ways to enable and to facilitate increased ambition over time? One answer to that is potentially the linkage of regional, national, and subnational policies uh, as a way to increase ambition. And when I refer to linkage, what I'm talking about are connections among policy systems, in this case internationally, that allow emission reduction efforts to be redistributed across systems. Uh, this can lower cost, and lowering costs certainly can increase ambition. Now, linkage typically is framed as being between two cap and trade systems. But one of the points that I want to make from our research is that uh, given that national policies are going to be highly heterogeneous, they're going to include many different types of policy instruments, cap and trade, offsets, carbon taxes, performance standards, technology standards. You, as you'll see, linkage can actually take place between different types of policy instruments, not among all the types I just listed, but it at least among some of them. So therefore, what I want to think about is, with you is really policy instrument linkage in what is a very heterogeneous world. The merits, again, are lowering uh, costs, improving the individual functioning of the policies by reducing market power, price volatility, if they are carbon markets that are being linked. And a key issue is that this is one way of allowing for this very important principle from the Framework Convention, common but differentiated responsibilities, without sacrificing cost effectiveness. But there are also some concerns, some very legitimate concerns. One is that there are distributional impacts within jurisdictions. Even though linkage will be good on net for both jurisdictions, that doesn't mean there aren't winners and losers within those jurisdictions in terms of individual firms. Also, there will be automatic propagation of some design elements, in particular cost containment elements, banking, borrowing, and safety valves or price collars. Uh, 
and there's a reduction of autonomy. There's a certain degree to which the country, when it's in a link, is also depending upon the activities of another jurisdiction, another uh, country. Now, from research we've done, and when I say we now, I'm referring to the Harvard Project, but it's it, it's not from myself. It's Gib Metcalf, an economist at Tufts uh, University, and David Weisbach, who's an econ economist at the University of uh, Chicago, uh, did work in which they demonstrated that linkage between different types of policies uh, is feasible, but it ranges from straightforward to absolutely infeasible. Uh, and I think I'll come back to that in uh, a moment. Last year at this same meeting, but in Paris, um, we reported on some work when we addressed the question of what needed to be in the Paris Agreement to facilitate linkage. And the first principle we came up with in work that was uh, Dan Bodansky, who's on the panel today, Seth Hodel, who is a, a student at Harvard Law School, and again, give Metcalf from Tufts, what we came up with, first of all, was a principle of do no harm. If poorly designed, an international agreement can inhibit effective linkage, essentially through so-called supplementarity requirements. But what did the 2015 agreement need to include? Well, that's a 45-page paper, but to boil it down to a single sentence, if I had to, which I do, it would be a statement that countries can achieve parts of their NDCs targets by financing or otherwise facilitating actions in other jurisdictions. And that was accomplished. That was accomplished with the uh, internationally transferred mitigation outcomes in Article 6.2 because emissions reduction, reductions occurring outside a nation can be counted under conditions yet to be specified through the guidelines uh, for uh, achievement of one's own NDC. This enables the formation of everything from clubs to really bottom up heterogeneous linkage. So we're talking about firm, firm trading, not Article 17 Kyoto Protocol, which was trading of assigned amounts. The heart of the research that we're, we're now moving forward with is recognizing that there are three types of relevant heterogeneity. I already mentioned one, which is that the policy instruments across different jurisdictions will differ. Uh, and we cap and trade linking with another cap and trade mechanism is straightforward. It's already happened in some parts of the world, as you may know. Linking a cap and trade system with a carbon tax is also relatively straightforward, not quite as straightforward, but it can be done through essentially offsets. And in fact, linking cap and trade or tax with a performance standard is possible, again, through offsets. However, linking any of these with the technology standard, we recommend against. It's really not feasible or sensible, and that's because these are all output measures based, but of course, the technology standard is looking at inputs instead. A second form of heterogeneity, which is becoming perhaps increasingly important, is the level of jurisdiction. Is the jurisdiction regional, as in the case of the European Union, which is a party? national, which is the case of the countries that are the, essentially all the other parties uh, to the uh, Paris Agreement, or is it actually a subnational entity? And I probably don't need to tell you that given what Dan Bodansky just took us through in terms of the U.S. election and the likelihood of U.S. participation in various forms going forward, given that 42 percent of the U.S. economy is covered by aggressive, meaningful uh, climate policies, namely the West Coast and the Northeast with cap and trade systems, the possibility of this kind of heterogeneity in the Paris Agreement could become, could become increasingly important over time. Third and finally, uh, crucially, is there's the heterogeneity of the NDC targets themselves. Some of them are hard emissions caps, mass-based caps but others are rate-based rate -based emissions caps, in some cases per unit of economic activity, and in other cases per unit of output. And then there are relative mass-based emissions caps, typically relative to business as usual in some future year. And then finally, there are others which are non-emission caps, such as measures which uh, pledge a country to a certain degree of penetration of renewable energy sources by a particular year, and then finally, there are some that have no cap at all in, the IND, in their NDC. 
So the question then, therefore, that becomes germane, if you, if, if you can think of it this way, is think of we have three different categories of heterogeneity. We have several possibilities under each. I want you to think of this not just as a, a table, but as a three-dimensional matrix. And then the cells of that three-dimensional matrix are the intersection of any of these possibilities for the three different types of heterogeneity. Ooh, this doesn't look good. Uh, so I don't even know. Let me see if I can go. Okay, I'll read off of my, I have my notes here on this. Uh, so the question then becomes, the first question becomes, of those cells in that three-dimensional matrix, which of those linkages are desirable? And some of them are obvious. Cap and trade, cap and trade, mass-based, hard cap. That's the easiest one. Which of those are not as easy, but still make sense? Which of them are even less easy, but are feasible? And which of them are unwise to permit or allow because of uncertainty that they would bring into the process? So that's, that's the task for the research. That's work that is ongoing. For the negotiators, there are also a set of questions to develop the necessary uh, accounting procedures and mechanisms to determine how these ITMOs will actually be tracked to avoid double counting. And then who will it be that will provide oversight for Article 6.2 and such linkage? Will it be the UNFCCC Secretariat or will it be some other party? So to conclude, uh, the Paris climate talks, as I've emphasized, were a success, but that doesn't mean that we know whether the Paris Climate Agreement itself is really going to be successful. That's something we're not going to know for many years. International cooperation is obviously essential for this global commons problem, uh, but the key action is going to be at regional levels, national levels, and depending upon what happens at the U.S., it, it may be in the case of that country at the subnational level. Uh, the Paris Agreement provides a very important opportunity for a new path forward. I think one key necessary condition has been met, which is adequate scope of participation, but the other key necessary condition is adequate ambition of the policies. In years to come, to be honest, uh, the major locus of international cooperation may continue to be the UNFCCC, uh, but it may not. It may be other venues. It may be the G20. Uh, it may be climate clubs. The important thing I want to emphasize at the end here is that under any of those venues, the importance of linkage is going to remain for keeping down costs and increasing ambition over time. So uh, finally, I'll just mention that if you would like to uh, see the slides of any of us, they will be available on the UNFCCC, the COP website, I believe by tomorrow. And then shortly after that, they'll be available all at the website of the Harvard Project on, on, on Climate Agreements. So you can go there, the Harvard Environmental Economics Program, my own website, my blog, or you could even follow me on Twitter um, if you like to get climate information at all times of day. So with that, thank you very much. So now I have uh, the privilege of uh, introducing someone with whom I've worked with for years, as I have with all the members of the panel, uh, Atmar. Carbon pricing. Atmar. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. So the Paris Agreement was definitely a diplomatic success. But the crucial question is, can the Paris Agreement solve the public good problem and international cooperation? In order to show you the challenge of international cooperation, let me point to the goals, the aspirational goals Paris has agreed on. Now, first, Paris said we want to stabilize the increase of global mean temperature well below two degrees. And if you try to analyze, so what is the remaining carbon budget? So you could come up with the conclusion that for a 1.5 degree budget, basically, in the worst case scenario, we have already exhausted all the, co the, the available carbon budget. In a best case scenario, we might have uh, additional 
200 gigaton CO2, which will be exhausted in the next five years. It looks a little bit better when we um, uh, think about the two degree target, and there's a range uh, in the budget, and the range is uh, determined basically by the climate sensitivity, uh, by the assumptions in the models and the scenarios about the technological availability and so on. But the crucial message here is, if you look at the so-called NDCs or INDCs, you can see that the remaining carbon budget, even if we will be successful to fulfill the INDCs, which are now on the table, in the best case scenario, there are remaining 400 gigatons. But in the worst case scenario, we have already then a carbon debt, which basically means in the future, we have to compensate uh, this negative this uh, uh, negative carbon debt uh, with uh, compensation and negative emissions in the future. And it is even more, more worrying when we think about what is on the table within the INDCs when it comes to the plants of coal. The existing coal-fired plants and the planned coal-fired plants sum up to basically over the economic lifetime, a global carbon budget about 400 gigaton CO2, which basically means coal alone will absorb most of the available carbon budget. And this shows you basically how ambitious it will be in the future to come up with a ratchet up process, a race to the uh, top instead, a race to the bottom. And as you know, and this has several times been mentioned, so the Paris Agreement has an interesting structure. There are voluntary contributions. There's only an informal mechanism uh, and uh, which provides intense incentives and punishments. And the crucial question is, can the voluntary contributions do the job uh, to achieve global cooperation? So what we know from the public good games, it's quite important. Large groups of people are willing to cooperate when other people are also cooperate. They are saying, basically, I cooperate when you cooperate. And people start out by giving something, but contribution drops when free riding is observed and when the voluntary contributions are intransparent. And the crucial question is therefore for the Paris Agreement, how to sustain conditional cooperation for climate change in order to avoid a race uh, to, the, to the bottom and to come up with a credible ratchet up process. Now, one way to do this is, and this is the proposal here, which I would like to discuss with the panelists and with the audience here, is to combine carbon pricing with strategic transfers. So, how to introduce a carbon price? And uh, basically, all of us and all economists know that carbon pricing is definitely the most cost efficient instrument for uh, emission reduction. And in addition to that, the carbon price measures in a very credible way the ambition of a country. So then you can think about the costs, not about the marginal costs, about the total, total costs dependent on the carbon pricing. And uh, this basically means when the carbon price is increasing, a country has to be a additional incremental mitigation costs. And the crucial challenge is when we are living, or we are living in a heterogeneous world where we have poor countries and rich countries, and countries which have different ambition levels, we have to think about how to design climate finance and the strategic, the strategic transfers in order to increase the carbon pricing and therefore the ambition level. And therefore it is easy to understand or easy to design a transfer scheme where you have basically recipient countries and donor countries. And the most important uh, innovation of the proposal we make is this is not just a transfer scheme which is imposed on countries, which is basically in their own self-interest. Why is it in their own, uh, own self-interest uh, to come up with a, such a strategic transfer? Let me describe first uh, how such a strategic transfer could work. First of all, uh, the strategic transfer should be designed in a way that when a country has higher costs, mitigation costs than the average, normalized by size, it can be GDP or it can population, uh, 
then it will get a transfer, a transfer, which uh, then takes into which are taken into account by the countries in the self-interest, and then they determine based on the transfer the mitigation effort. And it is in the interest of the donor countries to provide such a transfer because this increases the ambition level on the one hand and reduces the overall mitigation costs. And therefore, strategic transfer can enhance cooperation. Increased incentives are available to reduce as countries anticipate that they only have to pay a fraction of the increased mitigation costs. A fraction, basically 80% or 90%. And this is determined endogenously by the negotiation process. And countries either contribute through their reduction of emissions or through compensation payments. And these compensatory payments basically are the funding source of these transfer schemes. So we have climate finance available in the Paris Agreement. So 100 billion are promised. And there are all the multilateral funds available in the Paris Agreement, like the Green Climate Fund, the Global Environmental Facilities. There are key players uh, which are contributing to this process, like the World Bank or the Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau in Germany. And the current approach, and this is from my point of view, the most important shortcoming, the current approach is that most of this transfer are basic based on projects. And here there are a lot of problems with project-based uh, disbursement of funds. It's the issue of additionality, the effectiveness of decarbonization pathways. So this is the current approach. And if you take into account the incentives from strategic transfers, you could come up with a different approach where we finance not projects, but policy packages. And here you have, a, for the countries, a twofold advantage on the one hand, when they implement a carbon price, either via tax or an ETS or other performance standards. So they have the internal, in the best case, some internal revenues. And in addition to that, they will get transfers, which can then basically finance their mitigation efforts. What we have done in a, a different project, we have to evaluate, uh, when we evaluated already uh, the potential of uh, carbon revenues, for financing infrastructure investments for example universal access to water supply universal access to sanitation to telecommunication and electricity combined with such strategic transfers and it turns out that for many countries uh, um, uh, and universal access uh, to this infrastructure uh, uh, services is available it's just an example to show you that countries can really benefit from such a kind of policy-based strategic transfers. Now, let me conclude. National determined contributions can be translated in an implicit carbon price, and based on this implicit carbon price, countries can establish an explicit carbon price. The next step is then a coordination process on this carbon pricing, and this carbon pricing can help to establish conditional transfers. This conditional transfers can be financed by strategic transfer payments, can, and this can ratchet up ambition level of the prices, and this can also increase then cost-effective mitigation measures. Basing transfers on compensating the differences in incremental mitigation costs is almost ideal because it depends on the heterogeneity of the country and what uh, we can show in some of this game theoretic analysis, almost full cooperation can be established and can be achieved. So this is basically the proposal. And this proposal tries to combine the already existing features of the Paris Agreement in a way which in the end can help to solve the cooperation problem. Thank you very much. So thank you, Otmar. Uh, so I'm uh, delighted now to present our final speaker and then we'll go to your uh, questions and comments. So be thinking about your uh, questions. Um, I'll suggest before I introduce, uh, please uh, wait for the microphone to be brought to you and also give us your name, your institution and the country you're from. 
you will ask your question. But first, we're going to hear from our final speaker, certainly last but not least. I'm delighted that Kelly Gallagher could be with us. You know her both from her academic work and from her time in uh, government. And interestingly enough, she's going to talk about uh, bilateral and many multilateral agreements as complements to this UNFCCC process. Kelly. Thank you very much, Rob. Can everyone hear me? Is it close enough? All right. Um, well, let me begin by just reviewing the very slow road to Paris. And as exciting and wonderful as Paris was, we have to remember that it took 23 very long years to achieve an agreement that essentially was global in scope. And as we look forward to the post-Paris era um, and a future global stock taking exercise that won't take place until 2023, uh, we can probably predict with high degree of confidence that we'll have a very slow road post-Paris to whatever its successor uh, turns out to be. Um, as others have already discussed, there are some major achievements in the Paris Agreement. And for my purposes, I, I tried to distill them into four. Um, first, the universality of the agreement, the fact that almost every single country uh, in the world submitted an INDC is a tremendous achievement. Essentially, we achieved a stabilization in emissions, but certainly we did not avoid um, a two degree temperature change, much less 1.5 degrees uh, with this agreement. We've created some new ambitions for climate finance. I think they're going to be uh, challenging to operationalize. Um, and we have established a process through the convention and the agreement itself to potentially strengthen uh, the, the agreement over time. Obviously, limitations, the slow process, uh, the, the, the gap, uh, as many people have already talked about. Uh, very few people are talking about this question of whether or not countries will actually fully implement the INDCs. So we're assuming full implementation. Uh, I certainly believe that countries intend to do that, uh, but it may prove more challenging in some instances and under certain conditions. Um, and as we've seen with the US election, political realities can change country by country as well. And as Dan so eloquently discussed, there was deferment of some pretty significant uh, issues in the agreement itself. Um, so, my contention is that uh, bilateral and mini multilateral agreements can be highly complementary to the UN FC. Smaller sets of like minded countries have now become the new imperative. And these agreements can initiate a virtuous cycle, can generate momentum for the UN FCCC process, can be negotiated and Im implemented much more quickly, can be complementary rather than supplanting the UN FCCC regime which was a prior major concern about them. And I'm, I have three additional bullets that didn't make it onto this original slide. They can also have separate but equal standing as international agreements. They can permit greater experimentation with new approaches since the risks of failure are smaller. And they can allow for first mover advantage. So those countries who try, maybe they fail, they learn, and they can potentially gain advantage in that regard. There's a few conditions for um, believing in and executing complementary agreements. The first is that each new agreement must represent a measurable additional improvement on the commitments in participating countries, INDCs, or I guess we should be saying NDCs now. Um, bilateral or many multilateral agreements are, are not complementary if they take steps backwards or somehow undermine existing NDCs. Um, the new agreements also can and should be enshrined at the COP each year, so their cumulative impact is recognized and understood in the stock-taking exercise and reviews that occur uh, under the uh, convention. So now I'd like to just give you two examples of evidence that these can, in fact, do all of the things that I'm arguing uh, can be done, can be achieved, and then give you two potential examples of possible future complementary agreements that could be contemplated. So first, the evidence. 
Um, the first bilateral agreement um, that I want to talk about is the Brazil-Norway agreement from 2008, if we can remember back that far uh, these days. Um, and this was a bilateral agreement between Norway and Brazil. They had a shared interest in reducing deforestation for different reasons, but it was a fundamentally uh, shared interest. Norway agreed to pay into an environmental fund if Brazil reduced its emissions from deforestation below the average rate of the 1996-2005 period. Um, this performance-based system was later replicated in other countries and contributed to the creation of the Red Plus system under the convention. The second agreement, and one which I worked on uh, as a government official, um, were the, the set of US-China uh, joint agreements. The first one was actually, oh, sorry. The first one was also uh, was a, actually a joint announcement. The second one in 2015 was called a joint statement. Um, and these two agreements um, initially uh, launched the process of countries articulating their INDCs. The United States and China were the first two to step forward very early far before Paris, November of 2014, uh, where they articulated uh, new targets, as you can read here. I'm not going to go through all of them. You're probably very familiar with them. And then actually in advance of Paris, uh, the two countries articulated all of the ways they were already beginning to implement their INDCs, even though uh, Paris hadn't even occurred. And this agreement was uh, an executive agreement between the two presidents of the countries. And at least under US law, it has equal standing. And so it should stand as a existing agreement that the United States must honor unless President Trump also decides to withdraw from that agreement as well. Um, there were a few important consequences of this agreement. I think it it's fair to say that it initiated a virtuous cycle of early INDCs. Indeed, many people did not believe that we would have so many countries who had already set forth their INDCs before even arriving in Paris. Um, it certainly was a catalyst for domestic policy in both countries. And actually, in the second uh, agreement, they established a domestic policy dialogue to share lessons learned about policies uh, that were being experimented with in each country. Um, some of the outcome language from the first agreement led, uh, actually was borrowed and used in the, in the Lima, um, what was it called, the Lima outcome? Call to uh, action. Call to action um, on differentiation and then ultimately the Paris Agreement. Um, <clears throat> So I think there was so much concern about, in this case, you know, the US-China agreement being a G2 type agreement that would supplant or replace somehow the convention. But I think what this shows is that it actually was highly complementary and catalytic um, for achieving the Paris Agreement. Um, and it really does have the possibility of continuing to exist independent of whatever happens with uh, President-elect Trump's decision to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Now let me just give you two uh, quick examples of a possible, these are just hypothetical uh, ideas of how um, smaller sets of countries that might have shared interests could think about a complementary agreement. And one that really strikes me as very promising is on non-CO2 gases. You'll probably notice if you spend some time studying the NDCs that many of the NDCs are purely CO2 uh, uh, focused anyway. But I think some countries are ready and willing to tackle uh, non-CO2 gases and might be interested in experimenting with different approaches for doing so. Uh, and this could be a way to get much quicker um, agreements that would increase ambition. And of course, the, the recent Kigali agreement on HFCs is a nice example of how this could be done. In fact, that was actually a major multilateral agreement. Uh, but you could imagine 
a smaller set of countries coming together around other uh, non-CO2 gases. Methane would be an interesting one, um, in my opinion. And then a second one is uh, resilience in agriculture. I think we are already seeing early movers. Uh, countries that are experimenting with approaches uh, to increase resilience and adapt to climate change. Um, and here I just highlight Ethiopia and Bangladesh as two such countries that are really, um, in my view, taking early leadership. Um, and it could be that they could find a way to um, create a kind of coalition of the willing who, who want to make a kind of early action and early steps and share lessons in a kind of club, resilience club uh, on, on agriculture. So these are just two ideas, food for thought. There are many other uh, possible agreements. I think there's a lot of interest in possible regional agreements um, on climate change, um, and that would be another approach going forward. So let me stop there and we can move on to questions. So thank you very much, Kelly. Thanks all the panelists. And now we do indeed have an opportunity for your questions and your comments. Uh, let me remind you, if you have a question, please tell us so we know who we're talking to, uh, your name, the institution uh, you're from, and the country uh, you're from, and wait until the microphone uh, comes to you. And the first hand I see up is over at the side here. And if you want to, by the way, if you want to direct your question to a specific individual, uh, tell us who that is. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lukas Hambele from the Wuppertal Institute in Germany. Uh, my question goes to Professor Gallagher and maybe also to Professor Podansky. Um, Kelly, you had a one bullet point on one of your slides that said that the, yeah, the contributions of multilateral and bi mini multilateral and bilateral agreements should be collated or could be collated under the Paris Agreement or under the Convention. Uh, I wonder how that would work and how, you, if you could just be a bit more explicit on that. And I, I guess Professor Podansky has expertise on that as well. I don't have any very concrete thoughts about that. So I actually, I will ask Dan to respond, but I think it, it isn't so complicated. I think there could be a decision of the COP to take note of such an agreement um, and, and at least rec, you know, provide formal recognition of this happening. And then depending of course on how all of the rules and modalities are elaborated both for transparency and also for the inventories and accounting such agreements could actually become part of those, uh, you know, be governed by those rules uh, if the COP took a decision to do that. So it could be that as part of the transparency mechanism, any such agreements would have to be reported and emissions reductions achieved through those agreements would be uh, reported uh, through those mechanisms. But let me see if Dan has any, any thoughts. Thanks. So I guess I maybe distinguish between agreements that are focused on mitigation and adaptation, but the agreements that were focused on mitigation, the emission reductions that were resulting from those agreements should be reflected in countries' inventories. So they would show up in the accounting uh, process. Uh, I guess then uh, I would think that they could well be reflected in future rounds of NDCs. Countries would include that so initially they would be additional to a country's existing NDCs, but then eventually over time they would be incorporated into the NDCs countries have. But I think they would show up immediately to the extent that they're leading to emission reductions in the country's inventory. So I think there'd be, um, uh, as with all of these actions outside the UNFCCC or Paris Agreement process, there's the issue of um, additionality. So uh, that's also true with uh, carbon clubs, with uh, activities by sub uh, state actors, by private actors. Are they additional to what's reflected in the NDCs? Do they help it close the gap between the NDCs and what's needed to keep temperature increase below, well below two degrees? So that would be an initial question as to, to what extent are they additional? But I would think over time, countries would reflect them in their future NDCs so they would be incorporated into the Paris Agreement process. Any other questions? 
Hello, I'm Heike Böhler from Darmstadt University in Germany. And I got a question that goes to Ottmar, but potentially also to the other ones of you. And that's a question of how do we communicate all those measures that you proposed? And I was wondering that, especially when I heard Ottmar, it's a really interesting thing that you're proposing. Complicated thing. I mean, it's even complicated probably for most of us. How do you communicate that to the public? I mean, we all know it's difficult to win an election with climate policies. Even more difficult as our policies get more complicated. So it also applies to the other ideas of linking policies. How do you communicate that in an effective way? Um, I, I'm not a communication expert. Um, I have always a hard time to understand my own stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, let me let me highlight one aspect here. And so, for me, it was a very striking experience to understand that why people in the negotiations are so interested in in transfer schemes and in climate finance. So this was for me very hard to understand because as a, a, an economist, I thought we are talking about uh, emission reduction instead. So we spend a lot of time uh, talking about climate finance. And I think uh, this type of model helped me to understand of uh, exposed rationalization uh, why is it important that people talk about transfers? The most important thing is here to combine the ingredients, the institutional ingredients in a way which might help us to, to come up with this kind of wretched up process. So this was my motivation. And I think within the UNFCC framework to talk about transfers between heterogeneous countries and the purpose of the climate finance is not so complicated. It seems to me it is very complicated to come up with the notion of conditional transfers because this is something which many countries do not like. But it seems to me uh, to, to have a measure which basically indicates the individual effort of a country, uh, indicating what kind of policy instruments are really cost effective and can be applied economy wide, seems to me very helpful. To communicate these things outside the this audience here is is i admit and i agree with you it is it is extremely complicated but it seems to me uh, from my point of view uh, it would be a first step if we really could get a better understanding among the experts so what is the nature of global cooperation how could we avoid free riding and how what are the the most important requirements for such wretched up process and it seems to me this is not really clarified and requires much more thought and much, much more research in the future. Very good. That's right here. Thank you. I am Mohamed Saleh from Mauritania. My question, unfortunately, goes to Stevens, who is not here, but uh, maybe Atmar uh, can help me. Too. My question is about when, uh, when you speak about uh, uh, party agreement with uh, political success. And when we heard about your census, we, you know, we know about that uh, it is uh, in, in, in term of implementation and uh, feasibility is not uh, a very uh, good agreement because it is not feasible and it is not implementable, firstly. Secondly, uh, to us, uh, my question is about uh, what is the degree of uh, uh, the agreement? Is it a national, it is an international agreement or it is a subnational? agreement, uh, the level, the low level of the, the, the agreement itself. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, who would like to take the first question? If I were to do so, I would ask you to repeat it, actually. I, 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 so my, underst my understanding of your question is, so you asked the question, so uh, what is Paris all about and what are the relevant governance levels, so to say. And my response would be uh, there are at least three governance levels. It's the international level where you have international cooperation. Then we have a third level, which is national policies, but the national policies in the NDCs are not binding. They are voluntary contributions. Uh, 
And then there are subnational policies. And uh, what Rob uh, explained us is that, so basically, there we have to deal with this multi-level governance in a situation where countries are or countries are heterogeneous in at least three dimensions. And to think about linkage, uh, policy instruments, regions in such a situation is, is a very complicated issue. But nevertheless, it's the only promising pathway because uh, Paris offers uh, an interesting combination of bottom-up and top-down approaches. And I would like to add to, to, to this dimension is it's a complicated architecture, it's a promising architecture, but it has also a huge potential that in the end we will fail with international cooperation. Great. Over here someplace? In the back? Yep. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Favor, please. Go ahead. Hello, um, my name is Sylvia Mitsunis. I'm with the uh, Center for International Governance, Innovation and Water. Can you hold it closer to yourself? Oh, did you hear who I was? Okay, Sylvia Mitsunis from yeah. the uh, Center for International Governance, Innovation in Canada. And I've got a couple of questions that I'm going to direct to Daniel Podansky um, that have to do with uh, the legal nature of the obligations. Uh, thank you for that presentation. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I sat in on some of the compliance uh, sessions here. And one of the things that were brought up by one of the uh, uh, delegates uh, was the nature of collective uh, obligations versus common obligations. Uh, for example, some of the uh, obligations on developed country parties with respect to uh, providing support, uh, one could say are collective in nature, but it was suggested that they were common obligations and therefore parties could be held to account for them individually. Um, so I'd like to hear your views on that if possible. And a follow-up question um, is the nature of the compliance committee. Uh, where you have indicated if they don't reach agreement, maybe there won't be one. But actually the language of the agreement establishes it. And there's language in the decision as well as to how it might operate. So I'd like to get your views on that. Thank you. So uh, the first question is a very interesting one because this is not also uh, only a feature of the Paris Agreement, it's also a feature of the UN Framework Convention, that in some cases they use the, the agreement uses the language, each party shall, and in other cases the agreement says parties in the plural shall. Uh, obviously, if it says each party shall, the agreement creates an individual obligation. So each party shall communicate, uh, maintain uh, NDCs. Those are individual obligations. Uh, when it says uh, developed parties shall plural, uh, I think there's been really no definitive resolution as to whether that's intentionally uh, was intended to create a collective obligation. So you could only assess uh, whether or not that obligation has been fulfilled by looking at what the totality of developed countries have done or whether there are individual obligations. As far as I know, there's been no real effort to try to uh, to answer that question. Uh, a basic rule of interpretation usually is that uh, differences in construction have consequences. And so if there's a difference between each party shall and developed party shall, there should be some uh, difference there. Uh, but I'm not aware, I'm not sure developed countries have taken the position, as far as I know, that they're not under an individual obligation to provide some financial resources. I don't know the answer to that, but I'm not aware that they have taken that position. So I'm not sure in practice it's made a significant difference. Um, on the second question, uh, on whether or not uh, there would be a uh, implementation of compliance mechanism in the absence of any rules, uh, I need to check, and I was meaning to, with the framework convention, but I think it too establishes a multilateral consultative process, but uh, essentially, that's a stillborn process if there are no rules about how it will work. I mean, so is there a multilateral consultative process or is there not a multilateral consultative process under the Framework Convention? Well, uh, to the extent there are no rules uh, about how it's going to work, it doesn't make much difference what the answer to that metaphysical question is. Uh, there's no possibility of actually having a, 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 a using that process. And I, I would say the same thing with the implementation and compliance mechanism. 
uh, if there are no rules that were adopted, it would be very hard to see exactly what would take place. Um, but uh, I'd need to think about that a little more. Um, but I think it would be uh, hard to, there is some more detail about it in the Paris Agreement that there was with respect to the multilateral consultative process. So I'm not, I, I will need to reflect on that a little bit more, I guess. I think with respect to the sustainable development mechanism in Article 6.4, it would be very hard to envision how that would get going in the absence of rules. Now, I'm optimistic actually that they will agree to rules. Uh, so I, I think the uh, scenario where they're not gonna be able to agree to rules is unlikely. So I don't think this question will probably ever be based in practice. Um, but uh, I, if I could reserve providing a definitive answer on the implementation of compliance committee, I would like to do that, thanks. So let's give this side of the hall a chance. Yeah, hi, uh, Steve Hurts with the Sierra Club in the United States. So uh, my question is about political enforcement of the agreement and climate clubs. So uh, a lot, sorry about that. Over the course of the week, we've heard a lot of talk about the prospects of the United States pulling out of the Paris Agreement and what the diplomatic response to that might be. Uh, and of course, um, countries trying to impose consequences on the U.S. has, or any country that either defects or doesn't follow through with its commitments, has a collective action problem, right? So it's hard for any one country to go first and try and impose consequences. So I'm wondering what you think of the prospects or the utility of a kind of climate club that would make it its business to sort of use its diplomatic resources to kind of defend the integrity of the club. Uh, of the of the agreement, either by creating incentives for countries to stay in or do more, or imposing consequences in other areas of diplomatic importance. Okay, who who would like Otmar? Do you want to? I'll take... I'll say something oh, good, at least good. to start us off. Yeah. Um, this notion of clubs has has often, which I was not explicitly talking about in my remarks. Um, I was thinking more of a complementary agreements of, of willing members that were not necessarily exclusive. Uh, but the, the notion of clubs uh, that has been proposed has a connotation of exclusivity. And part of the incentive to join the club would be to create rewards for the club that non-club members wouldn't have. Um, you could also create uh, penalties for those who didn't become part of the Club, whether it was something like a border tax adjustment or something like that. So I think that there's some potential for doing that. It could get very messy quickly. So I have always had a little bit of concern about the clubs in the sense that it could, it could lead to kind of an undermining of the Paris Agreement and the Paris process if there is a lot of tit for tatting, you know, in club creation here and in counter club creation, you know, in maybe different regions. So I think it's a risky approach, uh, but it might end up being a necessary approach if for whatever reason, the Paris Agreement doesn't um, remain as intact as it seems to me in this meeting. I mean, what I'm hearing in this meeting is that all countries are, intend to stay the course, and I think that's very heartening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I agree, and and I would like to emphasize so creating a club and try to penalize the non-club members. Uh, this seems to me is a very dangerous exercise. Mm -hmm. In particular, uh, if you think about um, the core elements of Trumponomics, so to say, <laughs> which is my understanding that one core of this of his economic approach is protectionism, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, if we penalize in the club, non-club members by a kind of a, a carbon tariff or something like this, so this indeed could create a, a lot of, uh, could undermine international cooperation in the broad sense. So I would say my feeling is this is not the way to go. Another thing is, so how could we, and again, how could we use positive incentives uh, for countries to, to remain in the club. So it seems to me this is a much more promising pathway uh, to, to think about. R&D clubs, something like that. We well, have this woman right here. Has been. 
had Sorry? Her hand, this woman right here has had her hand up. Ah, very good. <laughs> we have time for this. Unfortunately, we'll need to be the last question. Okay, uh, I feel very lucky then. <laughs> Uh, my name is Swapna Bhatak and I'm from Oberlin College and I would like to thank everyone for a wonderful presentation. And um, my question is particularly to uh, Professor Gallagher and if anyone else wishes to answer, that's uh, the most welcome. So you talked about complementary agreements uh, to Paris and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about trade agreements that could also incorporate the vision of Paris to some degree? Like, we know that NAFTA talks about compliance with Montreal Protocol or CITES. So I was wondering, are there any talks about complementarity with trade agreements with Paris at all? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I think that it's certainly possible for there to be um, complementary trade agreements. Indeed, there's been an effort to negotiate a green goods agreement. Um, so you could imagine agreements to reduce, actually the opposite direction of what we were just talking about, reducing tariffs or barriers to trade, non-tariff barriers to trade um, for low carbon or climate resilient technologies. And I think that would be a very constructive thing to do. Um, the other thing you didn't mention, but I also think is a very important issue on the agenda is um, investment agreements. And so I do think this is a very promising area where countries could agree uh, on environmental safeguards, uh, carbon safeguards on overseas investments um, that at least would govern public investments um, and, and those investments, for example, through MDBs. Um, but even, you know, there could be voluntary agreements uh, with private sector entities or public-private agreements uh, that could just on a voluntary basis um, put in place safeguards, social or environmental safeguards. And I think those would be very constructive. So if there's another short question that uh, requires a short answer, we have time. Anyone want to take a shot at it? Sorry. <laughs> Gabe Chan, University of Minnesota in uh -huh. the United States. My question is for Atmar. How do you think about additionality in the kind of uh, policy finance that you talked about? You, you mean so about the conditionality on the transfers, how it is, to what extent it is politically feasible? Additionality. The additionality. Yeah, so uh, in, in <laughs> <laughs> That's a very complicated thing. So if, if I would be the designer, so we would get rid of this ad, 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 additionality thing, because it would be basically the transfers would be uh, 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 designed in a way which is not project based, but it is policy based. And it seems to me this should be the most in, uh, important step forward. So we, we, we provide the transfer for countries who are willing to implement a policy package where uh, an uh, implicit or an explicit carbon price, an increasing carbon price, should be an important component of such a policy package. And th therefore, uh, uh, beyond this uh, project-based approach, so this might be a promising part, when then we could get rid of measuring the additionality. Great. Now, we really are out of time, and I'd like to take the couple of minutes we have left to thank our panelists for participation in this really terrific exploration of the implementation, elaboration, and also complementing the Paris Agreement, and also for their participation in the larger project of which this is a part. So I'd like to thank Dan Bedansky from Arizona State University, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, Otmar Aidenhofer from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and Kelly Gallagher from Tufts University Fletcher School Center for International Environment and Resource Policy and uh, her brand new climate policy lab, which she can tell you about. We will have a few minutes if you wanna come up and ask uh, further questions. And also, if you'd like to stay in touch with us, uh, the Harvard Project or any of the other initiatives, please give us your card. Uh, and finally, I do have just a couple copies of um, the report. So if you really feel like you need a hard copy, uh, I have a couple. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for coming.
Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hey, good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Hi. You're back again. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, <laughs> you're, you're a very really good question. Oh, yeah. Here's my card. Welcome. And I think I think it went well. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Yeah. I can't remember if you gave it before, but that's okay. Better to than not. Are you welcome? Oh, like. Hi. You're welcome, Bob Stowe. Yeah. Very good. You're